Hi, this is a presentation on developing a logic of machine readable land and property transaction, sorry, transactions with the LADM standard. A uh, bit of background first, we did a presentation on this topic uh, in a more general way in Deventa where we argued that policy initiatives in the LADM standard are both moving from the architectural requirements of the agency, i.e. land registration, to the architectural requirements of the ecosystem, i.e. the whole land administration domain. And this represents a significant change in perspective. Uh, we also state that LADM defines the social uh, define social rights relationships, and that's relationships between parties and rights. And in many instances, these relationships are unique to a jurisdiction. However, while transactions are framed through powers rather than rights, and so the abstract operations available through, through powers to change rights are broadly generic across jurisdictions. And this is a, an important point that frames how we can start to conceptualize generic approaches to transactions through powers. So we considered this event from the point of view of developing well-defined generic processes granted in legal, operational and standard basic uh, concepts. And we proposed that generic transactions on a land register can be framed through core LADM primitives. So a transfer is a transaction in the party dimension. A subdivision or consolidation is a transaction in the land dimension. And a rights alienation or amalgamation is a transaction in the rights dimension. So in this presentation, we'll describe these conveyancing transactions and its automation in more detail. And this supports what UNECE have been doing in terms of uh, viewing the whole automation of the transactions across the ecosystem. This is seen in Principle 20, where the land administration system offers real-time registrations of transactions largely subject to automatic digital checks only. Now that's a massive change in the way that things are currently done, and we currently don't have the infrastructure in place to do that. This presentation will discuss it. Transaction documents are standardized for machine reading, and so we uh, describe in this presentation standard approaches for machine readable transactions. So we have a conveyancing transaction life cycle which introduces a range of principles that support successful transactions. So a request is submitted to change a land register. This request is checked against the acceptance criteria. So is a transaction well formed? Are the key parties identified? Is the party right land relationship identified? Is the change specifically identified? Is the request appropriately signed? And these are kind of part of that specificity principle uh, defined by Henson in 1995. Is the transaction legally competent? Does the grantor have the power for the transaction? This is the power principle. Does the grantor give their consent for the transaction? Consent principle. You cannot sell what you do not own, for example. And do the grantor and grantee have the capability to undertake the transaction? I, are they frozen or are they underage? This is a capability principle. Uh, if the request is valid, it is accepted, and the registrable request becomes a transaction, otherwise it's invalid and rejected, and then the transaction is recorded or registered as appropriate. And so these supporting principles support the process of uh, processing of transactions. I want to dive into the power principle in a little bit more detail. This demonstrates that the granting party has the legal power to grant the transaction. And so a grantor's ability to undertake transactions is framed around the transactional power vested through the right itself, i.e. something that the right holder can do, or the powers vested in an agency or authority through legislation, i.e. what a juridical agency can do. And we'll discuss these transactions uh, and powers for first registrations, transfers, subdivisions, consolidation, uh, alienation and amalgamation of rights, and discharges and disputes. Okay, all of this will be done digitally. We've got a digital environment. There's a bit of metadata that you can read at your leisure if you download the presentation. We have a UML model for a uh, LADM-based party rights land approach and transactions approach. We can support that UML as SQL statements, which we can use to populate and prepare the database. Right, so we're now going to first registration. So we're going to do first registration, which requires a formal adjudication of any land and associated real rights. Uh, adjudication requires the determination of the spatial extent of the own tenure, the identification of a party which owns the land or holds the right, and the identification of rights which benefit or encumber 
the owned land, and evidence is required to support each of these right holders claimed. For this demonstrator, we'll start with a simple freehold with no encumbrances or benefits. So we'll start with our libraries, we'll open up a database, and we'll submit an application. And this is a machine-readable application sent through as structured data. In the future, uh, I'm working on something which will deal with uh, RDF, uh, which is Resource Description Framework, very simple subject predicate object approach, and we'll be using Shex and Shackle uh, to support that. But that's a world for a, a, a different presentation. But here we're seeing our structured data uh, in a kind of CSV type tabular format where we're uh, describing who's granting the right and the grantee, so the, the uh, empowered agency, the geometry, uh, in this instance the, the right type and its share, which is one over one, so it's an exclusive ownership, and the cadastral unit numbering that goes along with it. But as well as it being machine readable, we can wrap this up with some boilerplate to create a human readable version. Here we are, this is our deed of first registration. And so it's taking elements of the data from the machine readable and rendering them in a manner which a human can read. And it's essentially telling us that LRC, this overarching agency, is granting a freehold right over the land defined by the geometry to the party uh, grantee described in the atomic transaction. Uh, so the application will be checked against the registration principles, the specificity, the consent, the power, the capacity. And if it passes all of these uh, and the request is legally competent, the application is accepted for registration, which in this instance it is. Okay, and here we are. So this first registration is recognized as one. We've added a grantee, we've added the land, we've added the right in land, we've added the, the new owner. Okay, and we can have a look at that within our data itself. So here is our party index. Here is our cadastral unit or land index. Here is the right in land that's just demonstrating exact right over that cadastral unit. And here is the uh, party uh, and right in land linking element. And that allows us to have a look at our cadastral data within our cadastral map. And there is an exclusive right to ABC Council um, over LRC001. We can also have a look at that as geometry. And in fact, because we've got the geometry, we can have a look at it on a slippy map in the real world. Isn't that brilliant? Okay. So. In addition, though, we have this as a transaction graph. So this is transaction number one, and we can see there that we have all of our specific information that allows us to actually undertake the registration of this, um, uh, uh, of this um, um, transaction. Okay, so now we have our basic starting seed um, right relationship, we can undertake some standard conveyance in transactions, so our transfer of party, our alienation of right, or our variation of land. Again, let's load up our libraries. And so we'll do a transfer of party, and this is the ability to alienate all rights to the entire holding, for example, through sale. And so alienation through the party dimension. Uh, here we're looking at where we can transfer all or a portion of our ownership to a specified third party. So in this instance, the man in black uh, is going to transfer 50% of the ownership to the lady in red, so they end up owning in common each with a 50% share. Now in this instance, what we're actually going to do is to run five applications. Uh, so we're doing five transfers of party. So we're going to do a transfer of party whole, and then a few transfers of party part, and then a consolidation, and then a, a, a transfer and sale. So here is a sale of whole. There we are. Uh, so let's have a look at our transaction. This is transaction one, which we just saw that created our first registration. And here we're seeing the specificity elements. The grantee, i.e. the benefiter from the first registration was the ABC Council. They are now the grantor for this next transaction. We're all referring to the same cadastral unit, and we have a, 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 a grantor share. So we're going to transfer the whole share to a third party for our instrument and our grantee. So in this instance, ABC Council is selling all of their land as articulated in LRC001 to ABC Development Agency. And we can also have a look at the sale of part. Uh, let's actually look at it this way round. So, sale of part. So this is transaction two, where we've sold all of it from the ABC Development Agency. Now the ABC Development Agency is going to sell a third of their share, so they will end up owning it in common to Alphabet Limited. Fantastic. So again, we have our specificity, but we're also specific about what we're doing. In addition to this, though, they then have a subsequent transaction where they sell another third share 
to a different grantee called Barb Limited, so each of them will end up having a third share in common ownership. So that means that in the future, we might want to consolidate it, and this is our consolidation. So this has an application type of a transfer of party consolidate. We're consolidating the one third held by Alphabet Limited and the one third held by Barb Limited, and we're going to grant that two third share over to a new company called, sorry, a new agency called Conda Limited. And then, so that's our consolidations. So. Um, sorry, uh, transfers of party and consolidations of party occur. Now have a look at variation of land transactions. So this is a, a subdivision of a cadastral unit to create two or more cadastral units of a consolidation of multiple cadastral units to create a single cadastral unit. This is essentially alienation through the land dimension. And so our, our quick example here is a man in black who has got a cookie cutter which he'll use to subdivide his land where the man in black continues to be the owner of both of the new cadastral units which both have new cadastral unit numbers. So we're going to do four transactions here. Uh, we're going to do a subdivision, a consolidation, a subdivision and then a transfer of party. So sale and consolidation, uh, sorry subdivision and consolidation and subdivision and sale. So we can see here that each each of those transactions creates new cadastral unit identifiers and we see their version life cycle as they go through. But because they've got new cadastral unit numbers, we need to make sure that the uh, party who holds that right moves along with the uh, changes in cadastral units so that they always own the same thing and the right thing. And that's shown in this maintenance log here. So let's have a look at our subdivision. So transaction seven says that we're going to subdivide LRC001, our parent cadastral unit, to create two new cadastral units, LRC002, which is a new uh, parent CU and a new target CU. Uh, the right is freehold. The grantor is ABC Council, who is also going to be the grantee. Uh, and it's a VOL subdivision. Here is the cookie cutter we're going to use. We also have a consolidation. So we've created two bits of land through transaction seven. In transaction eight, what we're going to do is we're going to join them back together again. So we're going to take LRC002 and LRC003, which both represent freehold and they're both owned by ABC Council, and create LRC004 uh, on a VOL consolidation transaction. In this instance, we're providing our own geometry for that, although we could actually combine it from the geometry of the two uh, input cadastral units. And just to go for the, the general transaction, what you would normally see in such a, uh, an area is a, a subdivision followed by a transfer. So here is nine, uh, transaction nine, which is taking uh, parent cadastral unit 004 to create two subdivided cadastral units five and six, and then selling number six um, to the DEF development agency, uh, and it's selling the whole of it using a TOP whole transaction, which we saw earlier. So brilliant. It's nice and simple. But because we have all of this stuff in a graph, we can start to see how the cadastral units work with each other. So LRC001 is subdivided into two cadastral units in transaction seven. In transaction eight, those two cadastral units are consolidated, create LRC004, which is further subdivided in transaction nine. Right, we're now moving on to alienation of rights. So in AOR is where rights are separated from the body of the property and subsequently transferred to third parties. So this is used as that kind of bundle of rights metaphor. And this is alienation through the rights dimension. So in this example, uh, the man in black is alienating out a security right, which is then being granted to uh, a bank. So here is our, uh, we're, we're going to run um, five different transactions here. And we have a transaction log that says we've got a deed of charge, a variation of charge, a discharge of charge, and then we're putting a, a, a right of access onto a, a piece of land. So here we're seeing the deed creation, deed variation, deed discharge associated with a, a, a mortgage, so our security life cycle. And so we start at transaction 11. Um, and transaction 11 is where the DEF development agency which owns the land is creating a deed of charge, i.e. creating a mortgage, over LRC006. Uh, and that is to benefit the LRC bank PLC and its mortgage charge right. And at some point in time, the bank is deciding that what they're going to do is vary that 
deed so they might want to change the amount of, that's outstanding on the mortgage uh, and that transaction is submitted following the specificity principle but it also has a related transaction number 11 which is clearly articulated so again specified um, and then uh, ultimately that is discharged from transaction 13 which equally has its related transaction so seeing this chaining of transaction events we're also then looking at transactions 14 and 15, which are creating an easement right. So 14 is subdividing uh, a piece of land. It's subdividing LRC 005 to create two new polygons, 7 and 8. But over 8, ABC Council is producing a right of access, which is benefiting the owner of LRC 006. And we can see that on our slippy map just down here. So there's the area, and here is the oh the right of access for LRC 006 or the owner of LRC 006 now when it, within the uh, conference presentation I'm essentially going to stop here but I'm just going to go through a number of leasehold and other actions so the leaseholds are a, a special type of alienation of right uh, in this instance we're going to look at what would be leasehold abstraction in England to uh, do a block of flats so these are all of the transactions associated with extracting a block of flats from a parent cadastral unit um, there is a graph associated with it which becomes quite complex uh, but ultimately you know blocks of flats have a life cycle and they ultimately will then get um, demolished so all of those individual flats need to be sold back to a developer which is essentially what this is so there's lots of transfers of party and once the developer owns everything they can consolidate it back into a single cadastral unit and we see that here so this is that consolidation process okay um, but we can also do this for real estate complexes as well so this would be kind of a more European uh, uh, model where these flats can be owned so here we've got a load of different ownership relationships to create a, a group of common hold flats so in this instance the flats have been alienated they have got a, 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 a beneficial relationship against part of the remaining part of the building and then they've been sold off to individual people um, then there's a graph of the associated cadastral units as we saw early on so we start with LRZ01, we've got our subdivisions and consolidations, here's the leasehold flats, there's another subdivision here, once the leaseholds have been demolished, and here's our common hold flats for other buildings. So loads of exciting stuff going on there. Now, we've gone through what are the normal conveyancing transactions, what happens if there's a problem? Well, you get into a dispute. Uh, and parties can dispute the accuracy of a register via correction, lawsuit or objection of the legitimacy of a decision or transactional process via a grievance. We're going to focus on corrections and lawsuits. So a correction is any dispute which is sent to the registrar for resolution and needs to really focus on minor errors, whereas lawsuits are any dispute which is involved uh, an empowered agency other than the registrar, and this is normally for bigger things. So we treat disputes using a right of dispute approach where citizens have this power to raise this right of dispute. And any dispute is uh, raised against the register will be reflected on the register at either the cadastral unit or party level as appropriate. And a right of dispute has a, has a life cycle. So you register the right of dispute as a transaction. So that means that that dispute can be identified when the register is searched. The dispute is adjudicated by the competent authority, so the adjudication is registered then as a transaction. This described whether the dispute has been accepted or rejected, uh, and this in its own right discharges the original right of dispute. If a dispute is accepted and the competent authority submits further transactions to change the register, and then the competent authority is granted for these transactions, so you see a nice little lo logically and legally um, concise framework. So let's bring in our libraries, let's prepare our data, let's have a look at our cadaster. So we've got our common hold block of flats at the bottom, and we can see that on a web map if we so desire. So we're going to raise a couple of disputes. Mr Shears of Barber has received his title, but he's now become Lord Shears and would like to change his name. Uh, and he'd like that to be done as a correction rather than any other form of change. And he believes that his western boundary is in the wrong place, so he's going to raise a lawsuit against that. So here we are, here's a correction request where well, let's actually look at it in the human readable way, where uh, he wants to do a name change to Lord Shears the Barber. And so that is submitted and registered, and he's also then submitted his lawsuit request. Let's have a look at the 
There we are. Uh, and so he wants a right modification where the Western boundary of the property is in the wrong place. Please correct his title. So that becomes registered. So we now see that these disputes encumber his title. And we can see that in the search that goes on here. So if we search his title, we see that we've got a deed of dispute for the correction request and a deed of dispute for the lawsuit request. Uh, and the lawsuit is adjudicated by the Lands Tribunal. They go out and resurvey the property and it's found to be all within tolerances. So they reject the dispute. That is submitted as a legal instrument uh, with reasons as to why it's rejected. So we've got that whole audit trail. Um, and so the details of rejections are formally registered, become part of transaction history and can be queried in a search. And there we are. So if we now have a look at uh, what is outstanding against that title, we see we just have the deed of dispute. Now it doesn't mean to say that that lawsuit has disappeared, it's still there, but it's not active against that title because essentially it's been discharged. And then the correction is adjudicated and that's kind of a, a no-brainer, that's going to be accepted. And so let's have a look at the um, human readable version. So that is submitted. We put in a variation of change and it we do a transfer of party to make that change correct and there's our legal instrument okay that is submitted and done now if you've been paying attention you would have seen there that we have this kind of potential transaction blocker that's come up when we've been running the um, processes and that's automatically associated uh, automatically uh, created by understanding what encumbrances are associated with uh, each title now further checks should be instituted once a potential blocker has been identified so you can know exactly what kind of sub subsequent processing logic you need to to undertake so in conclusion we argue that land registration transactions are a common behavior every land register needs to undertake such, tra undertake such transactions and they share common characteristics by focusing on powers, we can identify abstract processes and map to you know, create, read, update, delete operations that are used to manage databases. And we've further described the foundational logic and operational concepts that require to support automation. All of this has been grounded in the LADM standard. Core land registration processes that have been defined that cover changes to parties, land and rights, and special rules used to describe real estate complexes at least have been outlined. We've also looked at the dispute processes and we've also looked at the freezing and unfreezing of property, i.e. what you can use to uh, determine potential blockers. So in order to automate transactions going forward, the transaction logic needs to be agreed, appropriate systems need to, to be put in place to support the principles and relationships and business logic will need to be expressed in appropriate digital representation to support automation, you know, first order logic ontology for example. And these are things that we discuss in more detail in the paper. And we believe revision, revision, no, revision of ISO 19152 should consider transactions in this or a similar manner to support ongoing digital transformation efforts, particularly on that move towards automation as uh, envisaged by UNECE. Thank you very much in